gravesides, wailings, tears, anguish, pain and agony depicts that things have fallen apart and the center cannot hold. Chino Achebe foresaw that one day the falcon would no longer hear the falconer. Rural dwellers in southern Kaduna expect the unexpected each passing day. They even follow people inside houses and shoot. So it's not in the farm, no. They enter the community, in the community, the villages there. On that day, they killed 11. Yes. The, the later we found some uh, remains in the bush, numbering 14. Ah, we are many. Because, no, it is my neighboring village, I can't ascertain the, the number of the community there. In the quest to unravel the unending violence and clashes in southern Kaduna and its environs, the International Center for Investigative Reporting went on a fact-finding mission as to why there is no end in sight to attacks and reprisals in towns and villages of southern Kaduna. Mararaban Rido community in Chikun local government area was our first spot of call. Mararaban Rido currently plays host to the internally displaced people of Nguanteleli and Pamadaki communities. The people of Telele and Pamadaki fled their villages in Kujama local government area on 18th January 2022 due to an attack by unknown gunmen. On a particular day, a particular night precisely, probably around 4.30 a.m. in the morning, we were sleeping when we were surrounded by unknown assailants who came in very large number and on bikes. The bikes were probably around 20 to 22, uh, with two persons sitting behind the rider and all armed with guns and other weapons any man that they met on their way they shot and killed instantly they were going around in their bikes going after the men like domestic animals and shooting them nobody was spared nobody at all was spared during their going around and killing people if you, whether you are old or you are young, so long as you are a man, you are short. We journeyed from Jikun to Kajuru local government area. On our way, we sighted the banner of the Bethel Baptist High School. The July 5, 2021 invasion and kidnap of 153 students cannot be forgotten in a hurry. It is over 50 kilometers distance from Chikun to Kajuru. Kajuru is meant to be a tourist attraction, but is now registered in the hearts of many as a no-go area. The Kajuru Kasu killing of April 19, 2019 still sends shivers down the spine of many. Here at Dogunoma community on the Kufana district of Kajuru local government area, we met Blessing Away, a 30-year-old physically challenged woman who recounts her near-death experience during the March 11, 2019 attack. The incident occurred on the 11th of March 2019 while the people in the village were sleeping. Just before dawn, we started hearing sporadic gunshots. By the time men could wake up, the attackers began full operations. Few escaped while others were unfortunate. In total, 73 persons were killed on that day as a result of that incident. The old man who was my caregiver also fell victim and was killed. Now, I live alone with my disability and I'm finding it difficult to feed with my children. Call it an experience too massive for his age and you would not be wrong. Jonathan Madaki saw his life flash before his eyes. 
The gunshot wound has been a constant reminder as to why he fears that he may not be alive to see another day. On a Monday, in the morning, we were sleeping. Then we heard that the Fulanis were around. Then my mom said we should get up. And we got up and we started to run. Then my mother took another route and so did I as well as my sister. And then we ran for a long time and we saw somewhere to hide. When we hid, they were shooting for a long while and then I got hit in the arm by the bullets and I fell to the ground. Then I said to my sister not to scream and she didn't scream and then we stayed there for a long while and when we finished we got up and entered another place we walked and walked and walked for a while and then we saw them together in another town i didn't mind them i just left and kept walking until we got to another community and we met with some of the people of the community who wanted going back to our own community and they took us and took us to the hospital ali dauda who also resides in the gunoma community shares his pain they burnt our houses and i was lucky but there are some who currently have lost their limbs today some have lost their properties and right now we live in shelters due to the fact that they burnt down our community. Honestly, I can't point out a particular cause because previously we were living fine. There used to be, in our town, there used to be a mosque where they normally pray and we usually sit together and chat. First of all, they started to abscond and started abducting and kidnapping for ransom. Subsequently, they left and started attacking the community. When we come, we run. Currently, no one even sleeps in the town. We sleep in the forest. There are other times when we even sleep on trees because it's not safe. Well, we, they allow them marry from among us, but when we want to marry from among them, they refuse. It has been like that since before I was born. Even from my family, they married two people, but currently, if it were to be us, they would refuse. This is Kefan Chan on the Jema local government area of Kaduna State. Kefan Chan has seen quite a number of attacks that includes those of Zipak and Kakumdaji. Those in their 40s and 50s cannot forget the Kafanchan 1987 and 2002 crisis in a hurry. Habiba Ibrahim is an octogenarian, a widow and a farmer. She is internally displaced and resides at the Emirate community at Kafanchan. The violence which erupted in Katacheri made Habiba physically challenged. This mother of 10 children and grandmother is Atiab by tribe, but married to a Hausa man. She converted from Christianity to Islam. Habiba accused the Atiab people of being responsible for the maiming done to her. She had gone to work on the farm. While working, we were called to harvest and then I took some of my equipment and prepared to leave for town. I was told to stay back that the town wasn't safe. I didn't even wait long before I realized that the community was ransacked. When I entered, they had broken into houses and searched people's property but could not find anything so they left. But they returned again with guns. I was sitting down, peeling maize, and that was when it happened to me and my granddaughter. There was another lady who was also killed. They butchered me and caught me with a machete. And I was begging them not to kill my granddaughter. She is not my daughter, she's just an orphan. I said they should please have mercy and not kill us and that was when one of them requested that he be given the machete with which he cut off my hand. After that, he shot me here. 
Till this moment, I still suffer pains from it and my head whenever I want to lay on the bed. I also feel excruciating pain to the point that I want to cry, even this moment. It is still swollen. If tears could bring back loved ones, then the wishes of Shuaibu Adamu Babangida from Katajiri would have been granted. About five to six years ago, if I have not forgotten, there was a misunderstanding between the Kataf people and Fulani people. We were living together in a village called Gidankaru and someone from there traveled to another community called Magamia where they had a misunderstanding with the Fulanis and getting there he was killed unfortunately and his corpse was brought back to our village. After asking them, he, he said no, he was going to call the soldiers. And on the way, one of the Atiyap individuals commanded him to sit down. I was already seated, and he sat by my right, with me next, then my mother's sister. After the moment my brother sat down, they shot him while we watched. Then they shot me next. Then my mother's younger sister, then the person following my younger brother. At that moment, I was on the ground, but they didn't know that I was still alive. But the other three died on the spot. At some point, one of them realized that I wasn't dead. He then took a sword and wanted to slaughter me, but he missed and hit me here. As he hit me, I got up and ran. He ran after me, I fell, but I continued running, so he left me until I got to the forest and I hid. While hiding in the forest, I could hear them say that some people had passed the area where I was hiding, but thankfully they didn't see me. After that, I called my I called my older brother, who is the chief imam in our town. Then he said to me, he asked me where I was, and I told him I was hiding behind the primary school. He then told me to come out, that the soldiers were around. The moment I stepped out, I met the soldiers. On seeing them, they said the body of someone was found inside one of the classes. When I checked, I discovered that it was my older brother's child. And coming out, I saw my wife and children, and they held me. So they held me and told me they had killed my child. That that is life, I should be patient. God gives and takes, so no problem. A reoccurring decimal sees the Fulani herder destroying farm produce, and he is in turn killed. These, according to Bala Musa, is the root cause of the unending crisis. No, I don't think this crisis has anything to do with religion. Well, they assume that because we live together with the Fulani people, we shield them from harm by hiding them in our houses. They came and searched our homes, but no Fulani was hiding there. Right now, there is no one living there. The community is deserted because it's been burnt to the ground, so there's no place to live. It has been burnt completely. Zonal chairman of Nieti Allah Southern Kaduna, Abdulhamid Musa at Barka, explains what stands out in the crisis. Uh, what I can tell you is, the same way everyone is crying because of the Fulanis, is the same way the Fulanis are crying because of communities, uh, especially in two parts. First, with regards to the issue in Zangun Kata of local government and the local government of Kaura, which involves at least three or four local tribes namely um, the Atiyap people, uh, the Baju people, uh, although the Baju people 
we didn't have much issues with them uh, only a few times but the major issues that headers currently face uh, with the Atiap and Kagoro people. Now, our enlightenment have become useless. Because of this, I am advising our leaders and stakeholders, both retired generals and people in government who we currently have in the society. I call them to focus their attention on our issues and also be aware of these lingering issues that we currently have. They should know that their inputs will go a long way in alleviating and resolving all of these issues that we currently face. Zango Kataf local government area has its headquarters in Zungwa. It has an area of 2,579 square kilometer and a population of over 300,000 people. Those from Kataf are predominantly Christians. This is Abuyab. Abuyab community is on the Zango Kataf. The bridge linking Abuyab and Gwanwakili or Zango Urban was reportedly destroyed by bandits. According to our guide, the journey to Apuyap would have taken less than 15 minutes, but it took over two hours. This used to be a shelter for Mr. Rodnard Biliok and his family. The house, which is now a shadow of itself, was among several houses brought down during the July 11, 2021 crisis. Mr. Biliok was one of the traditional rulers deposed by Governor Nasir El Rufai. Um. I lost, they entered here three times, this village. The first one is when they burned these houses and um, nobody was killed. Uh, they met one of our boys in the village here who went to fish in the river there. They killed him by name Adam Obala. Then after that, they killed uh, one of my grandson's wife. See the house right there. They went to apply fertilizer on the farm. And uh, they made them, the husband ran away. He was able to escape. And they killed the wife with pregnancy. Uh, after that, they came 4th November last year. They killed about 10 or so in this village. I don't think I can remember their names clearly now. Mm, they, they kill about 10 in this village. So plus these two, Adamubala and Charity Ayuka. Mrs. Naomi Biliok lives in the hope that the areas destroyed would get a new look. Where do I start? It affected me in so many areas. Education-wise, for my children, it affected me. Feeding, it affected me because all my farm products is being destroyed. Nothing we harvested, nothing. Then, shelter, it affected me. You can see, there is nowhere we can rest. If we want to rest, we get a, an empty sack, lie it on the floor somewhere in the shed, and rest. Apart from that, we don't have anywhere to put our head. So it affected me health-wise. If I remember all these things, I always collapse. Tabitha Siman lost five family members in the crisis. We were all seated on the evening of that day when information got to us that a nearby village was raided. My husband was seated with a neighbor. On hearing that a nearby village was attacked, they came into the room and quickly dashed out without telling us about it. I thought to join them outside, but when I came out, I saw them leaving. They said they were going to inform other neighbors about what happened in the village that is just a stone throw away. No further had they set out for the neighboring houses than we started hearing heavy gunshots. 
I shouted at the top of my voice, calling on everyone to scamper for safety, that the Fulanis were attacking already when we thought the attackers were still a distance away. Before our people could come out, they were closer than imagined. The few that escaped include myself, my parents-in-law and my daughter, but every other person we knew didn't make it out on time. Here they lay in state in their mass graves. This young man who did not disclose his name recounted how his father went missing during the crisis. On that fateful day, I woke up, picked a broom to sleep. Then I saw people running. And some came to me and said my father was captured. I couldn't make out what was said in that horrid state as I heard others shouting. Fulanis are on the attack. So I joined them to run to safety. Another person now told me again my father was captured in that area, pointing to a direction. Afterwards, we returned to check the bodies if we could find his body among the casualties, but we couldn't find him. Then we saw the Fulani crossing over the river. We assumed they dumped my father's body by the riverside. We went to check there, but didn't find his body till date. They obviously took him with them into Zango. Indigenes have accused the government of neglecting people living at the internally displaced persons camp, aiding and abating the alleged killers. The ICIR called Samuel Anwar for comments, but he declined. He, however, sent this response to a WhatsApp message sent to him. There is a lot more widows than there was in Zango Kataf. Despite heavy security presence around the internally displaced persons camp, they still live in fear and sleep with their two eyes opened. I have never ever heard the kids talking about killing, 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 killing until last year and this year. Little kids, two, three, four years old. He's gonna kill us. That, that affects them forever. We listen to gunshots everywhere for days and days and weeks. There was one Saturday, everybody run. The, the soldiers came and told us to get out of here. And we get to the gate and said, okay, now that we're here, now that we're in the car, where do we go? We didn't know. <laughs> we decided to go to Kogoro. I would like to see the fear reduced and some of that you know, if they were back home, I think would help. The training school played host to over 3,500 people between July and August of 2021, the highest the camp ever recorded. We have seen the death and the destruction, and it's not pleasant, it's not nice. Um, it affects everybody. I would like to see their houses rebuilt and them back in their own life. Living, living here in an IDP camp for a long time is not a good thing. It takes away your self-dignity, it takes away everything about you, and I don't think that's a good thing. If it was me, I'd be wanting out of here, but where do I go? Most of those at this internally displaced persons camp are forced to see this as their permanent home due to renewed attacks. We have many challenges. Number one, we don't have enough we don't have enough drugs. We don't have drugs. So some people will be sick and we don't have drugs to treat them. That is the challenges that we have. Paulina Kozan resides in this camp. She is from Zamandabo community in Zango Kataf. She goes down memory lane on the Zango crisis. I cannot tell what led to the crisis as it started in Zagon. And I don't know. I can't tell how it started. That's it. The killers have burnt down all our houses. If we don't have a place to stay, is it not better to run for our lives? Or what do we rather do? The entry of Lame Andrew into the camp showed vividly that all was not well. 
farm produce and all items befitting for a house were loaded in this vehicle, making her the latest addition to the already congested camp. Lame is from Kurume Masara. Yes, it's because the Fulani burn our houses and so we don't have house to live. So that's why I brought my things here. But the day that they came to our town, they came around 3 p.m. The middle of the night. We, we don't know what we have done for them, that they have to kill us, they have to eat our food in the farm, they have to burn our houses. We don't know what is the problem. So we just plead that God should intervene for us. Yes, um, our grandmom, they burned her in the house. My husband have an, because of this, he has an accident, so he is in the place where they, they usually take care of his leg. So what we want the government to do, we are pleading to them to help us, help us to repair our houses, to help us to talk to the Fulanese so that peace, peace will reign in our town and in our state. We journeyed from Kafanchan to Kurume Masara to ascertain the level of destruction to lives and property. But just 10 minutes away from the village, men of the Nigerian military prevented us from making headway. Late evening of the same day, we interrogated a youth from southern Kaduna who shared his thoughts on the crisis. Some traditional rulers do hide because they want peace, even if it will uh, even if it will jeopardize their people, they wouldn't mind. So injustice do come in. And because of injustice, that thing is equally triggering this day-to-day -day, uh, crisis. So that is why we are suffering. But I plead to the government, because the government are not doing well. You will find out that someone that is, uh, has been prehended in the act today, tomorrow you see that person going scot-free. And because of that, you, I tomorrow may engage into it because I know I will go scot-free. But I plead to the government of today, if you want this thing to end, it's very simple. Whoever that happened to be, to be prehended for the act, let justice be prevailed. Let justice take action. Once that happens, believe you me, ma, this thing will end. In terms of whatever thing negative, don't think of yourself alone, but think of the generation because we are the future leaders. The lead agency in charge of internal security of the nation has been accused by Southern Kaduna people of failing to abide to its rules of engagement, which is to protect lives and property. Security is not only for us alone. The locals have their own role to play. We need their support in terms of intelligence gathering and sharing, which I believe will help in no small measure in tackling the, the menace of herders and farmers clashes. We want them to also note that taking laws into their hands would never be a solution to this problem. ASP Jalige, who could not ascertain the number of suspects arrested charged and convicted in connection to the killings and attack in the region stated that investigation was ongoing with some cases already charged to courts um the ones arrested were investigated and charged to court those who are not arrested were still investigating and then trying to devise means on how to arrest them we have never stopped for one day. We have always been on this issue. In Southern Kaduna, our police officers, if you look at our police officers that comes from Southern Kaduna, if you look at their faces, you will know that they have not been sleeping. Just to ensure uh, sanity in that place. It, take it to be a continuous fight that requires a collective effort. With the collective effort of uh, critical stakeholders, the security agencies, government, I believe uh, this thing will end in, uh, in just, uh, I think we, we can bring it to an end. 
with these efforts. According to the Nigerian security tracker, between 2019 and 2020 in Chilkon local government area, 60 attacks were recorded which left 169 persons dead, 183 persons were victims of kidnapping, 104 bandits were killed, two deaths of security officers. Between 2019 and 2020 in Jema local government area, 6 attacks were recorded, 19 deaths, 3 kidnapped victims. Within the period under review in Kajuru local government area, 27 attacks were recorded, 392 deaths, 27 kidnapped victims, 13 bandits killed, 1 death of a security operative. Zango Katab local government area witnessed 13 attacks between 2019 and 2020. 80 persons lost their lives. In the four local government areas, a total of 106 attacks were recorded, 660 deaths, 213 kidnapped victims, 117 bandits killed, while three security agents lost their lives. Southern Kaduna is one of the most conflict-prone areas in Nigeria. Conflict between the indigenous ethnic groups who are mostly Christians and their Hausa Fulani neighbors who are Muslims has seen to the death of thousands of people in over three decades. The May 1992 uprising was said to have claimed 471 lives, 250 in Kaduna, 188 in Zengokataf, 33 from Zaria, Ikara and environs. A total of 518 persons were injured, 229 houses were burned or destroyed, 218 vehicles destroyed or burned. The Zango Hausa community reportedly lost 1,528 persons. On the 1st of February 2022, the Kaduna state government disclosed 1,192 persons were killed in 2021 while 3,348 people were kidnapped by bandits in Kaduna State. Kaduna Central Senatorial District was the most hit by the bandits, with 720 deaths. Southern Kaduna Senatorial District followed closely with 406 deaths, while the Northern Kaduna Senatorial District recorded 66 fatalities from bandits and violent attacks. These religious leaders bear the minds on the issues, just as they reiterated that both religions stand for peace. We have our own as Christians. Why? Because if we have been able to reach these people with the gospel, it would have been a different story. So, so far our prayer, and so far our call to those of us that are Christians is to pray for God's grace. The accusing finger has been pointed to both religions. But if we come back to our teachings, to our what is contained in our scriptures, we find out this kind of thing is totally prohibited. But the question you are asking to know the cause is lack of fearing of God. If you fear God, you cannot go directly and begin to mine someone, you cannot kill someone, all right? You cannot even say a harsh word to your fellow human beings. So with the fear ring of God, all this nonsense, or nonsensical attitude, sorry to say it, will not happen. If we adhere to the teaching of our, of our both religion. Those who spoke to the International Center for Investigative Reporting held that pathological hatred which stems from the fact that both religions do not take each other as one constitutes to the problem. Others likened it as the perceived unreadiness of the government to act. They stated categorically that the inability of the government in taking proactive steps when attacks and reprisals occur is a reason why there might be no end in sight to the problem. Battle of supremacy and ethnic sentiments The Kataf people have been accused of saying that the lands in disputes belong to them. The Fulanese reportedly maintained that they are no settlers because they are original inhabitants. 
lack of sanction on defaulters. Respondents claim that the known perpetrators of the continued killings have not been made to face any punishment. Diminishing influence of traditional rulers. Some attribute the escalation of the tension to monarchs who have their personal interest to protect, instead of fostering dialogue and community relation and standing for their people who are victims of the decade-long circumstance. While it appears that dialogue takes place almost on a daily basis with signing of peace pacts instituted by governments, still, this has not provided the much-needed peace and tranquility the people of southern Kaduna yearn for. According to respondents, what can guarantee lasting peace is for all aggrieved parties to return to how issues were in the past. That is, if a herder destroys a farmland, such herder must be punished just as the noted that the herder should thread with caution in his day-to-day -day activity. Governments have been told to take proactive steps in the occurrence of attacks. They have been urged to begin the process of helping to rebuild houses and villages destroyed so that those affected can return to their normal lives as such term helps provided are inadequate and unsustainable. Overall, wherever the pendulum swings, Justice and fairness must take center stage to stop the killings and destructions in southern Kaduna.